Hey guys, thanks for joining me on the show today. Today I'm in conversation with a guy called Greg McKeown, based in California, though he's an Englishman. And he is a two times New York Times bestselling author with his first book, Essentialism, that was huge. And his latest book, which we talked about, Effortless. We talked for over an hour, so we're going to split this uh, show into two parts. So the first part today, second part in a couple of weeks time. Thanks again for being here. Enjoy this conversation. You're going to love it. He's a great guy. Hey, listen, I really appreciate your time, Greg, and thanks for being on the show with me. I loved the book Effortless. I wanted to ask you, um, I'm, I'm always curious about what makes writers write about what they do. Why did you mm. choose this subject and that title? I was interested to ask you, first of all. You know, every question can be answered in different ways, can't it? And, and there's sort of 10 different reasons. But, but one honest reason is that is that when people read Essentialism, I actually spoke about this theme in it, right. uh, but I felt like it sort of got to some degree missed uh, because the, the framing of Essentialism is so clear between focusing on what's essential versus what's non-essential, that that was, that was the overarching narrative. Mm. But there's a secondary narrative in it, and I think it's just as important as the first, because it's not enough just to know what is essential, even to choose it, if you then go at what matters most in the wrong way, you will burn out and still not get the results that matter most. And, and as I was, you know, had that already in my mind, then you suddenly hit into this era we're in, yes. where I think there's just two kinds of people. There are people who are burned out, and then there are people who know they are burned out. <laughs> and in that environment, this subject, that this frame, uh, this mindset has the power of relevancy right now. And, and in a sense, it's bad news that it does. I mean, maybe it's good news for the book, but it's sort of bad news for me. And, and, and so I've just been delighted to see, to see it seem to have relevancy. You know, it became a New York Times bestseller. And then, and then just over the weekend, it, it, it was, uh, was selected by the Times uh, you know, the London Times as one of the, the seven books in its genre for the year, you know, so great. Well done. And, 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 and beyond that, it's just this sense I have when I'm working now with groups of like a, maybe a doubling or even a tripling of demand versus the pre pandemic period for the kind of work I do. And like I said, in a sense, that's bad news, but it, it, it shows that it's, maybe it's not a great book, but it's a great problem that it addresses and, and it has that, that, that relevancy right now. So how are you delivering that? Are you going into corporates and stuff, small businesses, large organizations, and so on? Where is the demand for it? Uh, yeah, the demand is, is, is through, you know, conferences or internal events. Uh, most of it's virtual, uh, mm. but, but which, which is, you know, for me, that's a really great thing. I, 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 at the, at the beginning when virtual was first sort of the thing, I thought, oh, I don't know, we're going to lose a lot and we do lose something, sure. but you gain something too. I mean, there's something to be said for the intimacy of just having a conversation. You know, we, we, we now speak to each other from our homes. Right. There's something yeah. about that. That's, um, that's, that's beneficial. And, uh, and, and so, but, and, and practically, I mean, you know, just, a couple of days ago did, uh, you know, we were able to do three keynotes on the same day. You could, it's impossible right. to do that prior to this, but you're, you're still reaching out into organizations uh, of, of, you know, a lot of the tech companies, Apple and Google and Twitter, and these kinds of companies are still in that, uh, that range, but, but also really across, you know, across, I would say all industries, all major industries. Uh, what's been interesting too is, is now, areas outside of the US, particularly all through Central and, uh, and South America. There's something very interesting happening there with essentialism and, and effortless. In, in Brazil, for example, I mean, I've just mentioned that, but that's because it's on my mind. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, essentialism and effortless, depending on the day, will be outselling Harry Potter. You know, I mean, like that's, you know, like that's ridiculous. Um, mm -hmm in the kind of genre that, 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 that I'm in, but I, but something is meeting the zeitgeist there and, and put it, put aside, you know, my books, as I'm working with these organizations, they'll often share with me the, um, you, you know, like the, the pulse survey results they're getting across their organizations. 
and wellness is so much lower and it surprises them. Everyone thinks, oh, we'll get a bit of a ding over the last year and a half, but it's much lower and often than they're expecting. And in South America, especially so. So you might have uh, maybe 25% of the people will say I, it's possible to have a job at this company and still have, uh, have good well-being. And that's a problem, right? That's a serious problem. And that's the people that are employed in often well-run organizations. Uh, and, and so, and so, yeah, we, I think we're at a bit of a tipping point. I think people thought they'd be done with the pandemic by now. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that it seems like it's going to go on and on and on, it's like, yeah, we've got to find a new way of working. Mm. What is the touch point for people, Greg? Is it, is it that they are battling um, complexity? Is the complexity of an artificial sort of man-made nature because you know, there's good and bad complexity, like fat, there's good and bad versions of it, as you know. Yes. I know in the book, you, you're dealing a lot with unnecessary complexity that a lot right. of organizations, as you know, um, seem to produce all the time unnecessary stratas of management, multiple meetings that aren't necessary. I mean, when I'm in America, I have a home in America in Phoenix, Arizona. And, oh, I, uh, I, I love Phoenix. I was just there. Yeah, I have places called Steel, but I used to get overwhelmed with the multiple choice in the Starbucks or the supermarket or the store. <laughs> the overwhelm and the complexity gave me in making what I thought would be a simple choice. So yeah. this tendency to overcomplicate things, your effortless so speaks to that. Is that what people are, are people connecting those dots and realizing that's what Greg's talking about? Well, I, I'll tell you what I think. You know, let, let me answer that this way. That when I'm in person with events, I'll ask people to snap for various questions. I'll say, yeah. okay, here are some things. And I use that as a teaching device, of course, to get everyone to feel not alone, that they're like, well, everyone's struggling with this thing. But the thing that I get not just a response to, but, but they'll, you know, like laughter too, is just the idea that everything is harder than it needs to be. Okay. Just that idea that everything's harder than it needs to be. People can feel that. And, and it's a, to me, what, it, what is going on there is that it's an evidence of success, even though it doesn't feel like it. Mm. If you are successful over a long enough period of time, if you have some relative stability over a long period of time, and I know people don't feel that in a VUCA world where everything's so volatile and so on. But actually, you know, even though even though the pandemic makes us feel things are crazy and even though we do have a volatility that we have to manage, if you take a longer point of view of history, you know, if you, if you say sort of over the last several thousand years, we're living in an absolutely incredibly right. good times. Right. And, and even the, the complexity, as you say, well, well said that there's positive and negative complexity, even the positive complexity is an evidence of success. It's an evidence of interdependent collaboration, you know, international collaboration. It's an absolute, to me, it's an absolute miracle. Mm -hmm. You know, when I, when you work in a major city and you look at that the bus arrives exactly as when it's supposed to. And, 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 the, and the, there's an Uber driver that you can get that's sort of volunt you know, voluntarily signing up for this. And they're there when they say they're going to be. And just all of it works. It's absolutely extraordinary. Mm -hmm. So that, that's as context. It says, well, well now our job is, is to how do, we, how do we remove the scar tissue from yesterday's success? If we have massive failure, failure simplifies. It'll simplify everything. And eventually, if you don't voluntarily simplify, then failure will simplify for you. Right. A great book on that called uh, The Collapse of Complex Societies that really gets into the, the historical uh, premise for that. Uh, and, and, and so, and so what, what I'm, of course, I'm arguing for and what seems to be resonant for people is that you have to simplify before you have to. You mm -hmm. simplify... You simplify to, because because it, it just makes life so much easier for you, for your team, for your customers. Uh, I mean, somebody just somebody just emailed me. I don't know. Somehow reached out to me of the last last maybe forty eight hours, and they said they said they were they went to the you know to the to the air, airport, and they said they had to show their ID six times between the time they arrived to the time they got on the plane six times. He said I don't look any different. 
Do they really need six different points in the process? Is that really what is absolutely you know, essential? That, that's just adding and adding and adding, and there's no one in charge of making it effortless. And the, the, as soon as you discover that this, it's a tremendous opportunity, improving yourself, but also your business, um, your competitive uh, positioning with other people, you're just easier to work with. It's easier to get the job done. Uh, and and so we have loads of chance there. That, um, you know, the large, you know, we're in this age of mega institutions and the larger mm. an organization gets, the more removed it gets from me and you, from the, the, the customer, as it were. And, the, you know, these shows like Undercover Boss, where the yes. boss goes back in the trenches and suddenly becomes aware how crap it is to work for him or her because of the <laughs> stupid policies signed off, you know, in some city miles away that trickles down and makes people's lives in misery and the morale is low and the multiple layers of, as we just talked about, stupid, complex things like the multiple IDs. It's that that I loved about the book. And I thought this is scalable to a large degree, don't you think? I mean, obviously it needs a lot of willingness to be vulnerable and open about the fact that we are detached from customers and we don't really care. And these organizations, as you know, the bigger they get, they're staffing more for systems and policies than they are for customers. Mm. So it feels like it's getting more and more away from us. I was on the phone the other day, you know, to Sky TV or your cable company. What oh, yeah. a freaking nightmare. Yes. And so all the branding about, you know, we're here to serve and nothing's too much trouble, all these branding on websites you get. Then when you show up to the hotel, or the airline, or whatever, it's a nightmare. So yes. you kind of want to thrust that book in their hands and say, read this because just the first chapter could revolutionize your business. But there seems to be, and have you had pushback to this is what I'm thinking. What would be the possible pushback to this? Yeah, I mean, oh, so much to so much to riff on what you just said. I mean, what you said, freaking nightmare. How true that is. How many things... I mean, that's why that line, everything's harder than it needs to be, is right. so resonant. And, it, oh. and it, re it resonates with me sort of like an echo, you know, to today. I mean, we just, we just, um, we, we're just starting, Anna and I, we, we, were, we were establishing the business in a new state yesterday. And uh, Anna's my wife. And, and literally, literally, we had to go through a hundred steps. I'm not exaggerating. I'm talking actually a hundred steps that there's no excuse for that. It's an outrageous waste of time. And, right. and, and this is sort of, this is like the upside and downside of digitization because digitization allows in, in, well, it allows for automation, right? Which is a tremendous possible advantage, but it's like a light side and a dark side to it because the dark side is if you automate complexity, that's un unnecessary complexity, right. then every single person forever afterwards now right. has to go through a right. hundred steps instead of five steps or one step. You know, I mean, if I think about this process I went through yesterday, I, I, I think they could have summarized it down to a single page, got the key information they had. I wasn't actually starting a corporation. I have all the incorporation details already established. Yeah. It's just doing business in that state. All they need is a picture of that original statement of, of, of articles. Of, and that's it. That's all. They'd have everything they need. It would be perfectly sensible for them. And instead, you've got all this noise. So, so I don't think that I don't get a lot of pushback like uh, this doesn't make sense to us. What it is, is that what it is, I think, is that is that you, no one's creating unintentional complexity on purpose. Mm. So complexity grows by accident. Mm. So what you need instead, you need, you know, you need your effortless uh, you know, ambassador. You need your effortless, uh, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Evangelist mm. who is, is looking out for this. Right. And, and if you can get there to the point that you have an effortless, you create a culture of looking for this, you, you know, you become like, a bit like, let's say, a company like um, uh, Southwest, maybe. Mm. Uh, I mean, Southwest Airlines is that there's that moment in their history, quite early on in their history. They're trying to be the low cost carrier to the, you know, to the to the country. They, 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 all their competitors are creating this uh, new ticketing machine that's going to cost them millions of dollars to yes. set up, and then of course many more millions to maintain over years. 
and then they're having this discussion that team meeting the executive meeting and somebody says do we care what continental thinks as a ticket and they're all like intuitively no we don't care about that just because mm -hmm. other people are doing it. it's not a good enough reason for us to do it and the art solution they came up with is they just use their existing system and printed on it this is your ticket mm -hmm. just to the instead of your receipt you also got that it, it doubled up as your receipt and your ticket that's what i'm trying to say and uh and they saved millions of dollars and all that time and all that energy that's just one small insight into a certain way of thinking that says just because everyone else is doing it or just because we did it in the past, none of that's good enough reason for now. Let's just keep removing right. all this stuff. And the, and the best the best business leaders, uh, I think, uh, you know, the, the real breakthrough people are doing this. They're, they're very good at, at removing complexity. They're constantly doing in the, you know, this is Jeff Bezos at Ammons. This is Steve Jobs at, 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 at Apple. They, they have had disproportionate results because they keep making it easier and easier for the end user. And their obsession around that uh, is, I think, exemplary, actually. I used to have a rant regularly when I flew before where we could all fly as, as much as we could yes, about yes. British Airways. Because British Airways branding was, we're here to fly and to serve. And I can tell you, they do one of those, and it's not the second. So <laughs> in England, we kind of all felt, um, you know, they fly but they're very snobbish, very stuck up. It feels like a club you're entering into kind of thing, especially if you fly economy. You're lucky so, to be there. Right, exactly. Um, and you kind of realized, and then when I flew with Virgin occasionally, the difference, the contrast between the two, the, the trickle down values of Branson, of it being fun and playful and growth oriented and investing in individuals. I remember, you know, being in a Virgin uh, business lounge in Perth, Australia, and I asked the lady at the check-in in the business lounge, what was the password for the day for the lounge? And the password was joyful. Mm. Well, in, in British Airways lounges, it's Budapest or Las Vegas or Romania. <laughs> and I thought... Those things matter, don't they? Well, I thought, clearly, in Virgin, they made sure that the cultural engineering traveled as far as the choice of a password in a lounge. And so in that lounge on that morning, everybody was using this word joyful that wouldn't normally be in your vocabulary that day, especially in a business lounge. And people were saying to each other, what's the password? And so you heard this yeah. word joyful being thrown around. Is it one L or two L's? And all this, and people typing the word joyful. And I thought, what a brilliant masterstroke it was because it was such an odd word to have in that hectic, stressful environment of the lounge. Whereas Las Vegas, Budapest, it so was typical. The password told me everything about the interface between who's in charge and it trickling down to us as the users between Virgin and BA. And the difference, as you know, between values and culture, values being beliefs and culture being behavior and making the culture the same thing as what you believe is the trick most people don't seem to be able to pull off. It's rare that yeah. what they say their branding is what they deliver, right? Yeah, oh, there's so many places to go with that too. But 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 when while we're sort of we have this throughput of like airlines and travel and what right. what it is and what it isn't, and 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 I I was in um I was in Storm Ida a couple of months ago. So it's coming into New Jersey airport and, and when I arrived, everything seemed fine. But by the time we got on the plane, you know, the storms were in, we sit on the plane for an hour, we come back in, but within an hour of that, there's like rain coming in through the ceilings and, and everything. So I go to the lounge, right? It's the United lounge, don't mind calling them out. And I'm in there and there is this, there is, you cannot leave the airport. You cannot fly out of the airport. You can't drive out of the airport. You can't walk out of the airport. You are stuck there and for an undefinable amount of time. Mm. And starting at, I don't remember 8.45, maybe it was 9.45, I can't remember. But whatever the time that that lounge ends, they just started screaming at their customers to leave. Wow. And it got higher and higher and higher till they're literally actually yelling at people through the microphone. You have to leave right now. And I just was like, like I'm, I actually didn't feel bothered. I didn't feel angry about any of it. I didn't feel emotional about it, but I did want to find out why, why they thought this was a good choice, you know? 
And so I did talk to someone about it that was there, you know, the closest to thing to a manager on site. And I'm just like, it's just a missed opportunity. Like right. it's such a no brainer right. to keep this open. It's yeah. such a no brainer to just go, look, there's, there's loads going on. Everyone's trying to find a quiet corner somewhere. There's no right. beds for anybody. At right. least here, there's a comfortable seat for a few extra people. It's right. so obvious yes. to keep it going. Yes. And, 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 and he's just, you know, he wasn't super rude about it, but he wasn't open to it. He just was like, well, look, that's the contract. That's what we have to do. And that's the policy. And it's like, uh, that's not, it's not good. You know, it doesn't, doesn't look good for United. That's the answer. Well, it's a what? policy so that we have to mess over our, uh, you know, our, our customers. It's, what I find uh, amazing, Greg, is how do these corporates find these rule quoting system adhering Nazis that when you deal with them, they just quote policy, even though they know what they're telling you is ridiculous. Like I was on BA, I was in economy, sat near the front between me and business class was the curtain, you know, I, I need a pillow, there's no pillows. So I say to the cabin crew lady, can I have a pillow? I'm sorry, sir, we don't have any. There's a pile of pillows in front of me. I say, well, there's a pile there, there for business class people. It's that. And she looked at me as if to say, I know that that is a stupid answer, but that's what I'm supposed to tell you. So when she'd gone, I went and grabbed the pillow and she saw me do it and she didn't care. She just didn't want to be the one to appear to permit me to do it. It's that, that, that these organizations yeah. find these people that are, that are willing to conform to what they know, even as a, a decent human being, a kind human outside of the job, they still uh, stick to these rules. It's like it's like the Borg on Star Trek, yeah. the mindless entity. <laughs> yeah, there's there's you know there's a lot here, right? Because okay, so let's let's deepen this conversation, you know, to to a quite quite an intense place, right? Um, okay, I want to go one level down and then and then even a level darker still. So <laughs> so I I interviewed the well ten maybe maybe more years ago. Um, Phil Zimbardo, who was the, uh, you know, the, the architect behind the Stanford prison experiment, which was, yeah, pretty clearly, even on the face of it, an unethical experiment, however interesting it was. Mm -hmm. it is, it is, I'm sure, of course, you know, the, this is, this is the, the prison experiment that he took select uh, students, some would be prison guards, some would be prisoners, and this is supposed to be two weeks. It didn't last two weeks. It had to be canceled before the end of two weeks because even within that time, right. the prison guards became so uh, so um, you know, seditious or, 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 or you know wicked. I don't know what the right word is I'm looking for. But uh, and and the and the 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 prisoners themselves became so, um, so they capitulated so completely to wow. these demands that eventually it pulled away. Now, there's a few levels to go with this, right? We always want to believe that in a situation like that, we would be the good person. Right. But statistically, we won't be. And, and so that's sort of the dark part of this. I mean, he, he told me, in fact, I just was chatting with him, you know, just, he's not, he's not very well now, but, um, uh, but just like within the last week or two. And, and he, he told me that his, his, the only person involved in anything to do with this that, that had a concern about it and raised that concern from the beginning was his girlfriend at the time. Hmm. She was the only one who had enough sort of ethical, wow. you know, uh, sensitivity to, to raise it rather than to capitulate. That included all the people that were involved in it and in organizing it and approving it and all the rest of it, right? Okay, let me go one level deeper, even, even more sinister. The same kind of process, right? I, I have ancestors that, that, that uh, were affected by uh, both Nazi Germany, but also, mm -hmm. uh, also the pogroms in Russia, right? And, and so I have Jewish ancestry. And we want to believe, I want to believe right. that I right. would be Schindler, right? Or someone right. like him, that I would be one of these uh, freedom fighters that would be on the trains getting people out. As, as, as... But the statistically... This is very, 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 very unlikely. Mm. But the, the number of people who are willing to be that countercultural is exceedingly small. Mm. 
And so it, it, it's beyond our conversation to try and like get to the bottom of it, but to try and answer that question of how can I live myself in such a way that I would not capitulate to whatever the, the forces are that are at play today is, uh, is that's a non-trivial, it's not just a thought experiment, that's a non-trivial pursuit uh, to try and understand that. And, and I think that you have to sort of, you know, I know that we're not talking when we talk about policy inside of, 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 of BA or United or whatever, we're not talking about this anything like the kind of stakes of life and death, the morality these other examples are, but I think there's still the same kind of human dynamics at play because it's right. about power differential and maintaining your position in some hierarchy and your willingness to support a position that makes no sense to you and that violates something inside of you right now. Mm -hmm. And to not allow that to govern you, to not capitulate. And that doesn't mean you have to become a big rebellion, rebellious person either, but that you say that I, there are things I will not do. Mm -hmm. I'm going to let the humanity of the person in front of me matter more than the policy. And and uh, yeah, I don't see much in way of modern educational systems and then the, the to, to, to suggest that, well, I, I know, I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm riffing a long time here now, but let me just one more element that John, John uh, oh, Goodman, um, I've just been reading his book. He wrote a book called The Undercover Story. I'm trying to find it now. The Undercover Story of American Education. He, he, he spent 10 years studying the causes, the, the, how the modern ed educational system was created. It came out of Prussia. And, um, and now this guy, he, the author of that book, was three times New York City Teacher of the Year, mm. twice New York State Teacher of the Year. So he's not coming at this from you know, like just an outside observer, like he's, he's as good as they get when it comes to teaching. Mm -hmm. But his basic discovery, he, he after he won all these awards, he wrote an article in, I think, the Washington Post or Wall Street Journal, most of the Washington Post, I suppose, saying, I quit, I think. And then he went on and did all this research. And when I started reading it, I almost started to shake with anger because he's named so brilliantly wow. the problems and the, the assumptions underneath this modern education system and, and that feeds into the modern, you know, the modern, you know, we, we live in a corporate environment. Corporatism has taken over, the rise of corporatism, the fall of almost everything else. You, in that environment, you are not being rewarded for being yourself. You're not being rewarded for being right. uniquely you, for pursuing right. your own conscience. It's not, that's not the prioritization. Right. You're sitting in rows. You've got to support what's being told. You've got to do, and, and, and he, he, he captures this so well. And this, I think you have to start very young uh, to be able to do something different. He, he uses the example, you used the contrast between Virgin and BA, and he, he, he uses a story when Richard Branson's mother drops him off hours from home when he's seven years old and says, okay, you gotta, your job's to get home. Hours and hours from home. It took him, I think the rest of, like I think it took him seven hours to make it home. Hmm. At seven years old, something like that. By the time he got home, Hey, of course, that's a, that's a, you know, maybe that's a very foolish thing that she did, but the goal was to give him experience, mm -hmm. not words, not talk, but experience out in the real world to go do something. By the time he gets home, he knows how to do stuff An independent voice and an independent way of thinking. And he's, he's, he's often referenced his mother as being absolute key for why he even could be an entrepreneur why he was able to revolutionize industries in the way that he went on to do. So I see all of this as being connected mm -hmm. into how you raise people and teach them and work with them. And then what they're going to do at that point of, of, of where, where, where policy violates conscience and right. which thing they're going to be dominated by. You right. can't train people for 25 years to follow po policy and then expect them to follow conscience. Right. You've got to actually have conscience be primary, the priority yeah. all the way through. If you want to develop, you know, I think a society that works better. Well, there's an Interesting. answer. Interesting. In I think it was a 2018 survey amongst 
uh, millennials asked why did they quit their jobs 70 percent mm. of them said we didn't quit the job we quit the boss yeah we love what we do but we don't love who we do it for and sure. this this cry of we we want to work somewhere and for someone uh, that sees us to whom we matter we to whom we matter more than helping them make more money we matter uh, as human beings our potential is important to them our flourishing in that organization i was speaking to my mentorship group that i do online a couple of times a month with people all over the world and speaking yesterday about this massive global shift that's taking place whatever people call it my term for it is moving from this old command and obey style leadership to servant leadership. And I think, you know, the Arab Spring of 2011 and the crash of 208 and Brexit and Trump and all of this stuff around the world uh, is not least indicative of this grassroots revolution against leaders that are not listening, despite them promising that they will in the pre-election meetings and then after elected and it cost David Cameron his job as you know because he was convinced that we would all vote to stay because he's in the echo chamber of the London bubble where they're all saying it's a given and when the country got a voice outside of London because our country is very London centric as you know when we got a voice outside of London especially up north <laughs> we all said hell with Brussels we're out of here because <laughs> we never yeah. voted to go in yeah and yeah. so now we're given a given a voice it surprised him and, and cost him his job, but it wasn't a surprise to millions of us in the country. This out of touch elite leadership in all walks of life. And I think the wild card of Trump to a degree, don't you think was, we're sick and tired of these career politicians. What have we got to lose? I don't know what they think now, but what have we got to lose by this wild card of this business guy who doesn't claim to be a politician? And we, at least with Trump, I felt as, as a communicator, and a teacher in communication around the world. We have a masterclass on communication. The thing with Trump was, um, what he said is what he meant. There was no double speak. There was no shading of it. He just said outright. And there's something about that plain speak that people kind of appreciated. And it made connection with him, to use your word, effortless compared to connection with politicians that never answer the question. And he left confused with the outcome. This surge in the world to me that's shifting, um, it, it's shifting the tectonic plates in terms of leadership on these massive global shifts. And as you know, the 17th century enlightenment finished up in the 18th century French revolution. Eventually the people, as you know, have had enough and something's going to have to give. And I think we're seeing that with, you know, Greta Thunberg and all these grass, grassroots level um, uprisings and revolutions and the George Floyd episode and the awareness that brought to what the black people have been aware of for generations and the outcry that we are not being listened to and systemically we have been abused. I, I think as you say it is a tipping point uh, era that we are in and that's why I think your book was so amazing and I, and I understand completely why it has the appeal it does. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation. I told you it'd be good. <laughs> Thanks for being here. I really appreciate your time and attention that you give me in being on the podcast with me. Hey, I'd love you to leave a comment or leave a review. It helps the ratings of the show if you guys do that. If you don't subscribe, maybe hit subscribe now and become part of the podcast tribe here with me. Thank you. Have a fantastic day. Appreciate Love you guys. And I will speak to you all soon.